Will ethanol derived from corn help reduce our dependence on foreign oil? Many experts say yes, but only in the short term. There are long-term solutions for providing our transportation energy needs and for helping to beat prices at the pump. Rapidly growing grasses such as this miscanthus plant or algae can help provide a new generation of biofuel solutions and they offer the advantage of not requiring land that is desperately needed to grow food. Join us as scientists, business leaders, and economic experts from all over the world gather together at UC San Diego to discuss how biofuels will help meet our future transportation energy needs and also contribute to the mitigation of global warming. Now one thing that rings in my ears in terms of, of this whole topic of uh, biofuels and the business of biofuels are the words of, of one of Silicon Valley's best known venture capitalists, John Doerr of Kleiner Perkins. And at the TED conference that was held um, in April of 2007, somebody who's been known as being one of the most hard-nosed businessmen um, in the whole venture capital world got up and told the audience, I'm really scared. I don't think we're going to make it. And what he laid out, of course, is the challenge that we're aware of in terms of climate change. And this morning, we have two incredible speakers. The first, Dr. Richard Somerville, to tell us about these, this climate change issue from a scientific perspective. And then to be followed by Chris Somerville, I understand they're not twins separated at birth, <laughs> who'll be telling us about um, the, the larger perspective of, of the challenges for things such as lignocellulosic ethanol. But to put all of this in broader perspective, I think it's fantastic that we're having this meeting this month here in San Diego, because a lot of the issues of climate change really started with the recognition of the work of uh, Charles David Keeling at SIO. And what he did was to, of course, set up the measurements of atmospheric CO2 concentrations at Mauna Loa, Dr. Somerville the first will be telling us about this more in his talk, but what I just want to point to you is the Keeling curve actually turns 50 in early March, just uh, about a month from now. And of course, what we've learned from, from that type of work and, and the work of the um, Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, which of course received the Nobel Prize just recently together with Al Gore, is that these types of CO2 concentrations are largely being driven by fossil fuel burning. And of course, as many of us are aware, and we'll hear more about this from Richard later on, that fossil fuel burning and the rise in CO2 is driving with high confidence a great deal of environmental change that is potentially catastrophic for us and the rest of the planet. And so the question, of course, is what are the solutions? I think we're all here today because we want to be part of the solution. And if you look at the interest of biofuels and how they might impact in terms of transportation, I think it's important to point out that biofuels and replacing the, um, the, the portion of CO2 emissions that come from the trans transportation sector with a fuel that has a lot lower um, impact in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions is, is going to be a really important challenge for us. But of course, it is also only one part of a much bigger picture in terms of the CO2 footprint you get from energy supply, industry, agriculture, et cetera. And so as we think about applying our scientific skills and our business skills to building a environmentally sound biofuels business and actually replacing transportation fuels, we really do want to put it into the context, of course, that we're going to have to be pushing on many fronts in order for us to solve this overall problem. And if we ask ourselves what sort of lead are we getting from the government, then of course the Energy Independence and Security Act has mandated that by 2022 we should be producing 36 billion gallons of renewable fuels. This is what they call the renew renewable fuel standard. 21 of that has to come from some form of advanced biofuels, and 16 of that, almost half of our total biofuels, should be coming from cellulosic biofuels. Now, of course, this really is the floor and not the ceiling of the possibilities. 
And so things such as the billion ton vision, which we may hear more about from Chris Somerville, have presented um, the possibility, of course, that we have the capability in terms of land and in terms of the application of future technologies to actually get close to replacing our, our transportation fuel use um, of, of 2006 levels by about 2025. What we would like to see from the government is rather than a, a patchwork set of targets, is from international governments, really, these targets should be stressing our overall strategy for emissions reduction um, and not only, of course, specific targets in different parts of the biofuel sector. Now, as, as scientists and business people, we're always going to be facing public opinion. And it might be amazing to us, of course, that Newsweek well, um, could, in fact, have a cover saying global warming is a hoax. But it's actually driven, of course, by some remaining public skepticism. And so I think one role that we have, so for example, just in August of 2007, 39% of people still felt that there was a problem in terms of disagreement with scientists, although perhaps encouraging science in terms of public opinion was in a BBC News poll in September. Uh, about 80% of the people in that more global representative poll were agreeing that man-made global change is here to stay. So we're going to have to play a role, both from the scientific community and the business community, in, in pushing back against this, this type of skepticism and helping people understand not only what the science is of the challenge that, that tells us with a great deal of confidence that we have catastrophic climate change, but also helping the public to understand what role we can play in terms of the science and the business behind building a biofuel industry. For me personally, I believe that these are some of the imperatives for success. We're going to, of course, need multiple feedstocks and multiple advantage molecules or biofuels molecules to really solve the transportation fuel problem. We're going to want to look at first and second and third generation fuels. We absolutely need aggressive commercialization for this to be real. It can't be solved in the academic sector. And in that respect, there was about 800 million of VC biofuel investments in 2006. And every indication is, is that's going to take off dramatically. We, of course, have to have a biofuel industry that's going to take into account environmental and economic impacts. It needs to be sustainable, and it needs to take in all of these types of issues relating to land use and the actual carbon footprint of transportation, refining, and distribution. And my own personal pet peeve, for which I agree I have a great deal of conflict of interest, is that given that yield is going to be one of the key drivers of a successful biofuels program, we will not be able to impact this carbon footprint without a significant increase in funding for basic plant and microbial science. We need to understand in a much higher level of detail the growth and development of plants and the types of pathways that exist in microbes that can be brought to bear on this problem. And you should keep in mind that in terms of competitive research funding, research funding as it relates to the agricultural sector is 1% that of the National Institutes of Health. And so I leave it up to us. This really is a situation where it is not an exaggeration to say that biofuels can change the world. And I think it's up to us and the speakers throughout this whole meeting to lay out the roadmap, to continue to lay out the roadmap for how we're going to get there. It's a privilege uh, uh, to be here to help uh, set the stage by providing some of the climate background that uh, motivates much of what you'll be talking about in these three days. Uh, what you're looking at here, for those of you to whom this is somewhat new, is the uh, rise in carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere since 1958. Um, we owe this curve entirely to the work of Charles David Keeling, who died two years ago. Um, there are many things one can say about, uh, about this curve. Keeling made the instrument in his own terms uh, 10 times more accurate than it needed to be, simply because he, uh, he knew how to do it. And the data are so good that you can see uh, if you detrend it and analyze it, you can see the Arab oil embargo you can, uh, in the 1970s. You can see El Nino's. You can learn a great deal about the carbon cycle by studying this curve. The rise in CO2 is entirely human caused. There's no natural cause involved here at all. The bulk of it is fossil fuel uh, combustion. 
There are significant components from deforestation and from certain industrial processes. Uh, but uh, we know uh, from many lines of evidence, uh, isotopic signatures of the CO2 being one of the, one of the primary ones, that we people are responsible uh, for this rise. And it's substantial. You can see from the curve, it's 315 parts per million uh, when keeling began, above 380 today on annual average. And so better than one out of four molecules of CO2 in the atmosphere today is there for human causes. We have changed the global co chemical composition of the atmosphere. The uh, rise and fall annually is photosynthesis. It uh, follows the northern hemisphere seasons because it's due to plants on land. I'm going to mention the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change several times. Steve Kay spoke about it. It's an interesting body. I've spent half my time on it for the last three years as a coordinating lead author for the report issued last year. And uh, I'll say a good deal about it. It's a, a kind of a UN uh, alphabet soup agency, uh, but it's really an organization that brings together the climate scientists of the world to provide assessments of climate science that are relevant to policymakers without being policy prescriptive. The uh, IPCC Working Group 1, that's code for the physical science part of, this, of the uh, report as opposed to mitigation and adaptation, uh, put out its report last year. The summary for policymakers was negotiated almost exactly one year ago at a plenary in Paris. There's, it's an 18-page summary of a 1,000-page book. I'll tell you in a moment how to get all of those for free. And it has seven figures, and I'm going to show you those figures. What you can see here uh, is uh, three measures of climate change. This is uh, surface temperature, uh, the temperature of the atmosphere near the surface of the Earth, plus the temperature of the upper ocean. The circles are the annual numbers. These are from weather stations and satellite data over the sea. The black line is a smooth trend. The blue area is a measure of the uncertainty, which is greater in the early part. This is 1850 on the left, present on the right, and uh, less at, in the recent part, where we have more and better uh, instruments. Uh, so the temperature has risen. I'll put numbers on this a bit later. There was a sharp rise in early 20th century, uh, leveling off and a slight decrease from about World War II into the 1970s, and a very marked rise uh, since, uh, since then. Uh, this is sea level. Sea level has to rise in a warmer world for two reasons. One is that the ocean, like lots of things, expands thermally when it gets warm. The other is that more mass of water is added to the ocean by melting ice on land. And again, you see greater uncertainty in the distant past. Uh, these are basically measurements from tide gauges, uh, essentially floats. There's one at the end of Scripps Pier just uh, down the, the slope from here. This is the satellite altimetry data, the red line at the end, grafted onto it. Uh, sea level rises a lot. The difference between an ice age, where sea level is very low, and an interglacial period like today is uh, above 100 meters on global average. And this is snow cover um, in the northern hemisphere, which is decreasing. The IPCC report is uh, full of many pictures of this type, uh, showing different ways of measuring the observational change uh, in climate. For those for whom the 18-page the summary of the 1,000-page book is still too long, such as <coughs> congressmen and the media, uh, <laughs> there's a one-sentence uh, I, I <coughs> highlight from the IPCC in its 20-year history. It's going to be 20 years old this year has put out four reports known as first, second, third, and fourth assessment reports. The first one in 1990, uh, which uh, helped motivate the Earth Summit in Rio, uh, <coughs> uh, came to, the, uh, to only the conclusion that this was an important topic. But by the second report in 95, just before Kyoto, this uh, language was issued as the, as the summary. The balance of evidence suggests a discernible. If that sounds like negotiated lawyerly language, it is. IPCC is an interesting hybrid between science and governments. And these uh, statements, in fact, every word of the 18-page summary is negotiated in a little mini UN General Assembly um, where the scientists are there to make sure that what's said is, is, uh, <coughs> is consistent with the full report, but the negotiators from governments, uh, State Department types, are there to uh, express it in their way. By the third assessment report in, in 2001, you get this much stronger statement. There is new and stronger evidence that most of the warming in the last half century is human caused. Uh, I'll show you a little bit about the science behind this. Uh, this cartoon shows how computer simulations of the climate system have evolved over the history of the IPCC and before. And in the mid-1970s, one was uh, trying to simulate the atmosphere uh, only and in a very simplified way. For example, there weren't any clouds, so the clouds couldn't change with climate change and feed back. Clouds are important reflectors of sunlight, and they contribute to the greenhouse effect, too. 
by the 1980s, when the IPCC was being formed, um, you had not only uh, some atmospheric physics, but some land surface physics. And by the first assessment report, the FAR, uh, that's the one in 1990, um, you had a simple ocean. Swamp is jargon for an ocean that doesn't move, but is a source of, of heat and water. By the second uh, assessment report, uh, in 95, uh, there was some atmospheric chemistry involved, and the ocean had some dynamics. The third assessment report, the most recent one until last year's, uh, was in 2001, and you see these extra complications that had been introduced. IPCC discovered last year that you couldn't call the fourth assessment report FAR because it's already been used, and uh, so this is known as AR4. At the same time, uh, computer models were benefiting from Moore's Law. And this is quite striking. Here's how the typical horizontal resolution, you divide up the atmosphere and the ocean into little grid blocks, changed over this 20-year uh, history of the IPCC. The Alps were these two uh, blocks here uh, originally, and now there's a great deal uh, more detail. There's been extraordinary advances in climate science, in, in observational tools like satellites, in theoretical tools like computer simulations. And they underlie the statements, there are two iconic headline statements in the fourth assessment report. Warming of the climate system is unequivocal. Um, here's where that uh, statement comes from. There are many lines of evidence, but this is one of them. This is like the other figures, is a figure from the summary for policymakers. These nine panels all show the rise in temperature. The black line here is the, what I showed you earlier, the rise in early 20th century, leveling off, rapid rise in recent decades. This is uh, the land areas of the globe. This is the ocean. Uh, just the fact that it rises everywhere uh, is enough to refute the common skeptic claim that uh, this is urban heat island effects. It's all due to hot cities. There are no cities on the ocean. And uh, you can see the rise in all six inhabited continents here. So the black lines here are observational data showing how ubiquitous this uh, warming is. The blue and pink lines are the results of simulations with the climate models like the ones I briefly alluded to under two different sets of assumptions. The blue one assumes that the climate change has been forced only by natural causes, volcanism, changes in the solar output. It never, in any of these figures, reproduces the rapid rise in recent years. The pink area is the result of computer simulations that additionally include the man-made forcings, the rise in greenhouse gas concentrations, carbon dioxide and the others, and uh, the changes in, in particle, particulate uh, emissions, the so-called aerosols. And you can see that in each of these figures, the uh, pink simulations do uh, succeed in reproducing the general nature of the rapid rise in recent uh, decades. And that's part of the reason for the confidence in the statement that this warming is largely man-made. Here's the second of the, uh, <coughs> of the headline statements. Very likely here is calibrated language, meaning it's just nine out of 10 chances. That's an expert subjective judgment that most of the observed increase is, <coughs> that means more than 50%, is due to uh, anthropogenic causes. This is the IPCC website. I commend it to everyone's attention. Um, you can download the entire report for free. There's a PDF file for each chapter. You can download the summaries, earlier reports too, and many other things. The IPCC is a remarkable organization. It's been a privilege to, um, to work uh, with it. Here's another figure. This is the 10,000 year perspective. 10,000 years ago on the left, the present on the right. Here's carbon dioxide. This reaches a natural level of around 280 parts per million. And then the very rapid rise here. This is the Keeling curve uh, here at the end. So Keeling's measurements graphed on to the earlier data. We're lucky, blind, pure, dumb luck, that fossil air is trapped in ice cores in uh, Antarctica and Greenland. It's when snow compresses other snow to form ice, there's little bubbles of air. The cores, uh, coring the ice, dating it, allows this kind of analysis. So we know what Keeling would have measured had he been working 10,000 years ago. This is methane, essentially pure natural gas. Again, this rapid rise. This is nitrous oxide, uh, many agricultural sources of nitrous oxide. These are also uh, greenhouse gases. So the fact that mankind is in many important ways changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere is undeniable. And here's IPCC's way around this problem of uh, making these things commensurable. Radiative forcing is jargon for measuring in watts energy per square meter of the Earth's surface what the effect is of the rise in CO2. Red is warming, blue is cooling, compared to the other greenhouse uh, gases and to the possible cooling effects of uh, particles in the atmosphere, which both reflect and absorb sunlight and affect clouds. 
And there's many things you can read off this right away. For example, here's the change in solar irradiance, which has been measured in the satellite era. It's about a tenth of a percent over the 11-year solar cycle. That's of order of magnitude down from CO2. So that's the refutation right there in a nutshell of the skeptic claim that uh, natural causes, particularly solar variations, are responsible for the warming. Not true. Can't be true. Um, there's a lot of other data on here. This graph also illustrates, to my mind, one of the, the downsides of the IPCC process. IPCC does a wonderful job of science assessment, but it can't, uh, given time, resources, and who's working on it, it can't do uh, everything, and it, it needs to be communicated. My metaphor is that the IPCC report is a rich load of unmined ore that has to be uh, brought to the surface and turned into movies and uh, textbooks and so on. I've picked out uh, as a sample, I'm speaking only for myself here, not for IPCC, but I don't think I'm saying anything inconsistent with the IPCC report. Here's some of the lines of evidence for climate change. CO2 growth is accelerating, the Earth is substantially warmer, Hurricanes is an interesting issue where there's much work to be uh, done, but uh, in the North Atlantic, where we have the best data, there is statistically significant uh, evidence that hurricanes are stronger now. The, the Arctic is warming faster than anywhere else. That's a feedback mechanism, uh, many of them, but the big one is darkening of the surface as snow and ice melt, so more sunlight's absorbed. Um, <coughs> Arctic sea ice is shrinking. This, uh, in fact, was before the recent uh, uh, dramatic reduction in the summer of 2007, and remarkably of the, uh, of the 12 warmest years since 1850, 11 of them are in recent years. Most of the warming is in still in the ocean, and all the oceans of the world are warming and warming to great depths. Um, I'm uh, close to the uh, end here, but I want us to uh, spend a moment on this kind of result here, which is very, uh, it's an encapsulation of, uh, of part of what the IPCC is able to tell policymakers. Uh, part of, uh, of what you're looking at here is the possible range of uh, rises in temperatures in coming years. This is 2000 at the center, 2100 is on the right. These are the results of IPCC asking climate modeling groups to run hypothetical scenarios. They aren't forecasts of how the world will behave. They're Gedanken experiments with computers. They're what-if uh, experiments. And the, so the, this is a, a <coughs> scenario in which there's heavy reliance on fossil fuels, continued population growth, and a strong warming. Notice that the curves don't diverge until uh, two or three decades into the 21st century. These scenarios here are, are ones in which there's less CO2 emissions. There's no er, attempt in any of these hypothetical scenarios to, uh, to uh <coughs> drastically reduce uh, CO2 emissions, but these are possible futures. Uh, this, by the way, here is the, uh, the low-end scenario if you had been able to freeze the chemical composition in the, in the uh, atmosphere at its 2,000 level. So one way that a policymaker can look at this kind of result is to say that if you make the, dis the judgment, which is a subjective judgment and not a scientific one, that a certain degree of warming is tolerable, this tells you what the, what the emission scenario compatible with that uh, will be. Uh, there are uncertainties. So IPCC says that sea level will rise somewhere in this range, that's over the scenarios, but there are things we don't understand. IPCC doesn't enforce a consensus where there is none. So where there is uh, an area where the research frontier has moved on, there's leaving a settled uh, science in its wake, the IPCC says so. Where there are open issues, research still to be done, the IPCC says that. And here, what's, uh, what one has in mind is that there are possible tipping points in the system, possible instabilities that we don't understand well enough um, to model. So this one that's referred to here is dramatized in this famous photograph. We know from paleoclimatic evidence that in the past, uh, <coughs> ice sheets have destabilized when temperatures like the current uh, foreseen degree of warming have existed for centuries or millennia. What we don't know, what the glaciologists can't tell us, is what the likelihood is of this happening now. That's active research. People are, are listening to ice quakes on Greenland as we speak. Satellite altimetry is measuring uh, <coughs> ice sheet dynamics. This illustrates one mechanism. Melt water from the surface falls through these crevasses and uh, lubricates the place where the ice sheet is, is grounded on bedrock and can lead to sudden destabilization and a, a rapid uh, rise. If you could put all the ice in Greenland in the, in the ocean, you raise sea level seven meters. Here are some more projections. Uh, we can talk, I hope, about ocean acidity later on in the meeting, 
It's one of the downsides of geoengineering. If you try intentional planetary engineering to reduce warming, for example, by putting reflecting particles in the high atmosphere, you still don't affect the fact that the CO2 largely ends up in the ocean eventually and becomes, the ocean becomes less and less dilute carbonic acid. pH in the ocean is going down and will go down substantially, and there, although much is, remains to be learned, that has potentially large consequences for uh, marine organisms, especially shell-forming organisms. We expect to see, and I won't read these to you for lack of time, but we expect to see a continuation of the, the kinds of trends that have, have been observed to date. Uh, this is Katrina, and uh, superimposed on a map of sea surface temperature. Hurricanes are creatures of the tropical ocean. They get their energy from the warm sea surface temperature. They don't form below a threshold temperature of around 80 Fahrenheit. And much remains to be learned as to how hurricanes will react uh, to a warmer ocean. But as I mentioned earlier, there's already evidence that the strongest storms are becoming more, more strong. It's also possible that the areas vulnerable to hurricanes, like our part of the world, um, <coughs> may change too. The climatology of hurricanes, as it's affected by global warming, is a rich area for results. You've ju already seen this picture here. This is a dramatization uh, in terms of geographical uh, distribution of warming for the picture I showed you earlier. This column here is the decade of the 2020s when the scenarios don't differ very much. The color code here is the darker the red, the greater the warming. And there, regardless of the scenario, this was the one with lots of emissions, and this is one with lesser emissions, this is in the middle, you see the Arctic warming more than other areas, land warming more than ocean, the north warming more than the south, but not big differences to the eye from these maps. By the last decade of the 21st century, when many of our children and their children will be alive, uh, you see drastic differences. This is a warmer uh, planet, this is a different planet from the one we have today. There's no Arctic seasonal sea ice in this scenario here. And there are vast consequences on uh, storminess, rainfall patterns, uh, vector-borne diseases, and all the other consequences of climate change for which the global warming number is just a symptom, the way body fever is of, uh, of illness. This is the final one of the IPCC figures I'll show you. This is the pattern of precipitation changes. Blue is, is wetter, brown is darker. You see that there's more rain in a belt near the equator and in uh, middle and higher latitudes, there's less rainfall in the subtropics where the great deserts of the world already are. Stippled areas are ones where the models agree so much that the statistics are more robust. This is associated with a general poleward um, trend in the migratory cyclones of middle latitudes. And we see evidence already uh, that this kind of change is occurring. These are solid results. It's bad pedagogy to show a, uh, a table, but I'm going to show this one anyway, just to call your attention to its existence. It's in the IPCC reports. Um, one way to read this here is going down is ever more intensive climate change. Uh, this is the global warming uh, in Celsius degrees, and this is the associated sea level rise. And so a policymaker can look at this and say, we can take two degrees of warming. That's a risk tolerance statement. Uh, there's no magic number below which you're safe and above which you're in danger any more than there is for, say, cholesterol. But if you think two degrees, which is a, a value that's been formally adopted by the European Union uh, and several other countries, this tells you what you have to do. CO2 has to be stabilized in this range here. It's already at 380. This is 350 to 400. This is CO2 equivalent using, in the kind of chart that I showed you earlier, the equivalent uh, CO2 of the other greenhouse gases and the aerosol particles. And if you're going to do this, then the carbon cycle, the way in which CO2 moves through the climate system, uh, tells you that emissions, which have been rising every year, have to peak soon, sometime this decade or next decade, and have to be reduced uh, ultimately by this amount. That's the challenge that we're talking about here. We're talk this is not a 1% change. This is a 50% or more change. We're talking about effectively weaning the world from fossil fuels, which are now 80% of the global energy system. If you're willing to tolerate more warming, you can get by with uh, smaller reductions in CO2 emissions and later uh, peaking of CO2. But this is what the science uh, tells you, and it's fairly unambiguous. And I think one of the challenges is to educate policymakers and the global population in general about these numbers. I went to the Bali climate negotiations uh, last month, and one doesn't hear about numbers like this. One hears uh, all kinds of statements, but the science 
is rather um, meek and uh, inaudible in the background here. The fact that so much has to be done to avert dangerous climate change isn't obvious to, to everyone. I think partly this is a science literacy issue, partly it's the disinformation, the uh, well-funded media campaign that's put on by some of the skeptics, uh, but it's a huge task. People don't know this. Thank you very much. <laughs>
return to the, the concept, when I said 1% efficiency, um, uh, there are many plants that will produce more than 1%. The average is not 1%. And so in fact, in the, in the discourse, one frequently hears vast numbers uh, in terms of how much land we would need to make an impact. And that's based usually on people taking average plant productivity over the whole surface, which is actually quite small. And I don't think that's the right way to calculate it. I think one should look at what we could do with some good acres. And this is a famous picture of Emily Heaton uh, standing in front of a plot of Miscanthus giganteus at University of Illinois. And this plant, according to Steve Long, has a 2% annualized solar efficiency, even though it underwinters under the snow for about three months of the year. Uh, um, this plant has, uh, this, this plot has yielded up to 26 tons uh, per acre per year. It's been cut at ground level for seven years with no fertilization and no irrigation. Of course, these are very good acres. So I would say 1% is certainly possible, um, uh, at least if we were willing to use good acres for it. Of course, in order to get that kind of yield, one needs water. Water is the main limitation to plant productivity worldwide, water and, and temperature. And so this is a rainfall map of the US. So, uh, in this region, it's reasonable to expect that we could get um, approximately 1% or more on, on good acres. Uh, much of the rest of the country is not going to be uh, really that useful for producing um, uh, biomass. As to what acres are actually used, there's a question of whether when I say good acres, whether we have to displace uh, 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 corn and soybeans, in, at least in the state of Illinois, the ideal land for production of uh, miscanthus would not be uh, the corn and soybean acres, but would actually be acres that are, are, are not uh, well used. Now, in that respect, there's also a lot of discourse or a lot of talk uh, about, uh, about uh, Brazil and, and the Brazilian experiment. As it's probably widely known, Brazil produces about 40% of its transportation fuel from sugarcane. And uh, they produce that 40% of their fuel on only about 3 million hectares. Uh, about half of their crop uh, down in Sao Paulo, so actually not near the forest. Uh, but the interesting thing about, uh, about uh, Brazil is that, first of all, sugarcane is, is uh, probably the most highly productive uh, species in terms of total biomass per acre. And in fact, my calculation is, just to put it in perspective, that if the Brazilians expand the sugarcane to what they, their, their best analysis is, they think they, this region of, of Brazil is called the Cerrado, and they think that there's 40 million hectares available in the Cerrado for uh, production of sugarcane. And if they use both the sugar and the cane, that is the cellulosic part of the cane, at theoretical efficiency, they could produce, by my calculation, half of all the transportation fuels in the world uh, on those 40 million hectares. So I believe that that's uh, a likely outcome, is that uh, in the future, uh, sugarcane will continue to be a, an important crop. So let me just summarize that by saying, uh, I think I consider it totally unresolved as to what the biofuel crops of the future are, but uh, because C4 grasses use about one-third as much water per unit of dry biomass, and because there's a large number of highly productive perennial C4 grasses, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that, that by and large the future of biofuels will be perennial C4 grasses. Uh, and people here in the business community may find that pretty challenging since it's hard to develop a business based on perennial grasses. Uh, however, uh, for the good of the planet, we should hope that that's the direction in which it goes. I want to now turn briefly to uh, the processing of that biomass. Um, this is a, a kind of from a recent study showing the, the, a biological method of, of uh, producing fuels from biomass. Basically, in this uh, scheme, one grinds the biomass up typically boils it in hot ast and then fermented to produce some ethanol. Uh, the remaining solids are then typically also hydrolyzed with a, for example, a cellulase. The sugars released by that are fermented to also produce ethanol. So this is the current paradigm, um, much in need of improvement, I would say. There are many places to improve this, for example, of a, a very kind of um, uh, processing component, which is uh, from a study by NREL showing that just increasing the amount of uh, solids in, inside a reactor uh, can strongly uh, decrease the, uh, uh, the, the, the cost of production. And, and fundamentally, uh, or more generally, 
there, there are many places, uh, the, the critics, such as uh, Pimentel and Patsik, who are much, uh, much in the public eye, uh, uh, have claimed, in fact, that the process, the current process, is so inefficient that it's uh, net negative for energy return. But I think it's very important to understand what they're really saying. That is, even the critics, uh, the most virulent critics of the technology, would say that if you just grow and burn uh, switchgrass, you can get a 15-fold net energy return. So the issue is not whether you can grow and process plants to energy. You can definitely do it for a strong net energy return. What they're really saying is that if you then take this positive and turn it into ethanol, they would claim you use 45% more energy than you produce because the process for converting it to fuel is so inefficient. And in fact, if you break down their costs, you can see there's vast amounts of steam and electricity. Others have pointed out that this is actually not true because these guys just add up the total costs. And in fact, modern engineering reuses heat very efficiently. And so, in fact, uh, you can, uh, other analyses claim it's actually five-fold positive. It doesn't actually matter for our purposes right now what the exact number is. The point is that uh, there can be a lot of inefficiencies in the processing of the biomass. And so a lot of uh, improvement is going to be necessary to really make it uh, work on a industrial scale. Um, so for example, some, uh, some of you may have recently seen the first uh, termite gut sequencing project was uh, published uh, by the JGI. And, uh, turns out termites are fine, uh, uh, have about 100 species of uh, bacteria in their uh, gut that secrete enzymes uh, that um, do hydrolyze biomass at a, at a sufficient rate to support the, the growth of, uh, of the termite. Um, um, uh, this kind of work is being expanded now. Uh, we, we and others are sequencing all the microorganisms in cow rumens and, and other species of termites and uh, compost heaps, looking for, trying to understand how it is that biomass turns over in the biosphere. Um, uh, in the days of synthetic biology, it's now become possible when you sequence a microorganism, never having cultured it, to synthesize all the genes that seem relevant and express them and, and run high throughput assays. So indeed, uh, at, at the EBI, we now have a bunch of teams uh, doing that. Uh, I'm not confident that, there's, a, that um, uh, there's inevitably a solution. It turns out that the rate of hydrolysis in the biosphere uh, is much lower than the kind of rate we need in order to develop a real industrial process. There's something called residence time in chemical engineering where you know, if you have uh, 200,000 liter reactors, you can't let them sit there very long or else you can't really amortize the cost of operation. And so I think residence time is going to be a big issue. So uh, actually, a uh, really big activity at Berkeley at the moment is the, the idea that maybe enzymes are actually not the correct approach to hydrolysis of biomass. And we have uh, uh, groups of chemists uh, exploring the development of synthetic organic catalysts for hydrolysis of polysaccharides and lignin. Another opportunity or possibility that we're exploring at Berkeley and I know is being explored elsewhere in the world is the use of, uh, instead of, uh, of different pretreatments, instead of boiling in hot acid, uh, we're exploring the use of uh, so-called ionic liquids, such as the one shown here. You can see that uh, these, these, uh, these uh, liquids have the ability to uh, um, decrystallize cellulose. So you can see after treatment with this ionic liquid, it becomes, instead of crystalline fibrils, it becomes amorphous. And this material is much more available to uh, hydrolysis, either by enzymes or theoretically by inorganic uh, catalysts. So I think there, um, this represents an interesting divergence from traditional methodology. Another area um, that uh, is absolutely crucial for implementing biofuels is that we need to be able to utilize all the sugars. So at present, of course, the technology for fermenting sugar is based on 5,000-year-old technology, uh, you know, uh, the strains that have been developed to, of Saccharomyces to ferment sugars for beer and wine. Um, Saccharomyces doesn't ferment xylose, which is the second most abundant sugar, or in fact, arabinose or any of the other sugars. Uh, and and NREL has, has done an analysis of what the effect of using the other sugars is. For example, in this analysis, uh, if you, you can see what the costs are of producing, by their calculation, an, uh, 
a gallon of ethanol if you use only the glucose versus if you use uh, some of the other sugars. So this is obviously a key priority for, for the field to develop organisms that, that utilize all sugars. Some, some, are, some organisms are already known, and in fact, uh, I think DuPont is building its biofuels business on an organism that does this naturally. The problem with this field in some ways is that there's a lot of moving parts, and so I would say at the moment, at least in my experience and in many discussions I participate in, the organism that will ultimately, or organisms that will ultimately be used for, uh, if fermentation is the route to production of biofuels, are not known today. Um, people are looking at thermophiles and acidophiles, and uh, uh, there's a, a large number of species out there that could be uh, considered candidates. Um, and ultimately, the general sense in the field is that when you find an organism with properties, that is, good properties, something that can live in 30% uh, solids, you know, ground up wood with all the toxic byproducts that are associated with that and, the, uh, and also quite t uh, uh, solvent tolerant, uh, then it'll be possible to transfer these and other pathways into those microorganisms. So I would say that this is a, a field that's far from, is really just in its infancy based on uh, the discussions I participate in. Now, so far I've sort of talked only about uh, ethanol, and, but ethanol, of course, is not the fuel of the future uh, for many reasons. I guess the most obvious reason is that it absorbs water and therefore you, you produce uh, uh, actually uh, corrosive, uh, it's a corrosive fuel. Um, and uh, if, we, if we think about the uh, nation's goals of getting, you know, 30 percent of uh, our fuels by, uh, from bio uh, by 2030, um, th that's going to be a stretch goal. We have 240 million vehicles, only 5 million or 6 million of them will burn more than 10 percent ethanol. Um, so it's, uh, so uh, either we're going to have to replace the fleet, which of course will eventually happen, or, and, and the infrastructure for moving fuel around, or we're going to have to develop a different fuel. Additionally, uh, producing ethanol consumes energy at the end product, so we think that uh, the fuel of the future will look a lot more like a, the fuel of the present than ethanol. And what I mean by that is that if you ask what are the principal components of gasoline and diesel, you discover that they're things like alkanes, um, C11 or uh, C12 alkanes would be very attractive. And it turns out uh, alkanes are not that hard to produce. Every plant is covered in alkanes. Fuel mixtures are currently very, very complicated. And so whatever it is that we can produce can probably be blended by the uh, large refiners into, uh, into a suit or re reformed into a suitable mixture. There are already a number of small companies uh, pursuing these approaches. Uh, uh, and so I, I think that may be. Uh, is going to be an important factor going forward. So it's important not to get stuck on the idea that ethanol is the fuel, even though that's what we're going to be making for the next few years. We may, if, in the future, and in fact, I, I think it likely that we're going to see something I would call hybrid biofuels in the future, in which uh, external sources of hydrogen may be used to carry out similar trans transformations of sugar to alkanes. And I think this is what it looks like, or partially what it looks like, and that is, um, uh, the first, uh, so what this is showing is, uh, is in this case, uh, uh, a refinery in which uh, oil is uh, coming up and there's uh, 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 coke is left over, a uh, highly uh, carbonaceous uh, material is left over after processing of petroleum, and that can be gasified to produce hydrogen, and the hydrogen can go directly into a hydrogen turbine or a gas turbine to produce electricity. Uh, in, pr in principle, uh, the, the fuel source can be varied. It can be biomass, it could be coal, uh, in fact, uh, or, uh, or any other uh, hydrogen-containing material can be gasified, and the hydrogen can be separated from the CO2 stream. In this manifestation, the CO2 is being pumped into a, an old uh, oil well, which, and there's a lot of that going on because supercritical CO2 is quite a good solvent for oil, and only half of the oil in the, in the current oil wells is recovered by existing procedures. So there's lots of interest in reusing the CO2 to mobilize more oil. Doesn't solve the climate problem, however. However, uh, there are also three sites in the world where CO2 is being pumped in really large amounts or relatively large amounts into aquifers, deep aquifers. So the most famous is the so-called Sleipner site in the North Sea, where a million tons a year of CO2 is being pumped into an aquifer, has been for the last 10 years. And the studies from this, uh, or the conclusions from this study, as I can understand it, suggest that, in fact, they think this aquifer could take the 
entire emissions of Europe if they could actually uh, get, get the CO2 out there. Now, in view of the fact that we have about at least 250 years of coal in the ground, uh, and it's very, very cheap to extract most of it, it seems likely that we're going to uh, actually use that coal. So I suspect and I hope that uh, we'll actually use it in, uh, in, in conjunction with some sort of sequestration of the CO2, and, uh, and that could make a lot of hydrogen available. So I think that we may see, in fact, that biofuels, or at least some large component of biofuels, become hybrid biofuels in which the carbohydrates are being used to carry the hydrogen in the form of an alkane or, or a, high, a highly reduced uh, substance that can go directly into the existing uh, uh, fuel infrastructure. And that's very different than the idea that we somehow have to switch to fuel cells. I just want to put that in perspective. Uh, I just want to mention the first three sites for large-scale uh, saline aquifer sequestration in the United States have been identified, and so studies are now underway here to, uh, to also uh, expand the, the, the work from in this field. And I, I, I think no matter whether biofuels become the carrier, this is going to be an important part of our energy future, I believe. So let me summarize what I, what I said somewhat briefly. Uh, in the context from, from, what I, from my experience in the field of biofuels during the last several years, there's basically four major buckets, I guess. One is uh, we obviously need to develop energy crops and the associated practices. There's lots of issues there uh, associated with collecting and transporting and storing biomass on a large scale. You know, fires are going to become a new phenomenon or are going to reappear as an interesting phenomenon, I think. If you imagine, you know, the Great Plains used to have massive fires when the, when the settlers arrived. And if we start growing these biofuels crops again, that's certainly something we're going to have to pay attention to. Uh, we need better catalysts. They could be enzymes, but they might not be enzymes for conversion of biomass to sugars or fuels. We need, obviously, to develop industrial microorganisms that can ferment all the sugars, but, but maybe not. Maybe George uh, and, and his colleagues will develop totally uh, uh, synthetic routes for reforming sugars. Uh, and I, I think if we are taking a, uh, uh, a biological approach, we need to develop new types of organisms that secrete fuels other than ethanol. There's one bullet that I forgot to put up here, and in fact, uh, of course, all of this has, uh, if, for any of this to come to pass, it has enormous socioeconomic implications. Uh, you know, it's manifest frequently in the public discourse these days as food versus fuels. Uh, but it can easily be uh, fuels versus the environment. You know, there's lots of concern about the degree to which uh, this will lead to deforestation and uh, uh, starving the urban poor. Uh, I personally uh, think it, uh, uh, that this is not going to be extremely deleterious. Uh, for example, let me, in the food versus fuel debate, uh, 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 let me just uh, an example of why it's more complicated than it seems to be on the surface is the following. In Africa, there's about 75 million acres of, of corn grown, maize, and the average yield is about 20 percent of the yield of the U.S. crop. Uh, for, not because the land or water or is not good, but because uh, it's mostly in, in terribly infested with striga, and striga can be prevented by the, with a herbicide. But the investment in agriculture in Africa is, is, is very low because the prices are very low, and the prices are very low because the European Union and the United States subsidize agriculture to the tune of about $100 billion a year, and we keep prices low. Now, as we start to use farm commodities for, uh, or land, more importantly, I, I would hope we would use land rather than commodities to bake biofuels, uh, prices certainly of, of uh, farm commodities will and should increase. Uh, they should at least go to a point of profitability for farmers so they don't need subsidies. Uh, and that, in turn, will allow investment elsewhere in the world. And in fact, there's tremendous opportunity elsewhere in the world, such as the African maize example, to strongly increase productivity elsewhere in the world. So uh, I'm not an economist, and I'm not saying that that will all just work out. But uh, we have 17 groups of economists at Berkeley now examining every aspect of that on a global scale to try and help us understand what the consequences are to food production, to social equity, and to environmental effects on land use around the world. Uh, so I, I, uh, someone else should really talk about those aspects, but I didn't want to convey that somehow 
this is just a bunch of technologists rushing forward to make a technological solution. What we really need, in fact, to implement this is to work very, very closely with environmentalists and economists and social scientists to make sure that if, if in fact, the technology can be improved to the point where it seems it should be implemented on a large scale, that we do it in a responsible fashion. Um, that uh, at Berkeley, I guess it's probably widely known, we recently received uh, uh, a big uh, grant from uh, BP to, to explore these things. And in, uh, um, we're, we're actually the largest single group of people that we're supporting with that grant are social uh, and economic, social scientists and economics uh, people to, to go after these issues because as we know, uh, those of us at least who are plant biologists from the, the GMO uh, uh, episode, uh, social uh, or societal acceptance of technology can be the rate limiting step. And in fact, I think that that's likely to be a very important factor in biofuels going forward. So we really have to pay careful attention to that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.